Hey, this is Mark Patterson back again with another great episode of Finding Your Summit. And this week is a great way to start off the year with a bang 2018 with a guy at USC who's a student. He's 20 years old and his name is Jake Olson. And the thing that makes Jake such a unique soul is that the guy is blind and he plays on the football team. He plays on the USC football team. He's a snapper and he got in two games this year, this past year, 2017 season. And I think he's the first D1 football athlete ever to do so. But the guy is just a remarkable dude. I mean, here's a guy that had a rare form of cancer in his eyes. He lost his first one when he was just a youngster. And then years later, when he was 12, he lost the other one. And through that whole process, he formed a relationship with the old, great college football coach, Pete Carroll of USC. And that just kind of morphed into something, into something. And the next thing he knew, he was invited to come out and walk on at USC. And there he is. And he documented, you know, what it is like. I was sitting there in Heritage Hall. He's got his guide dog next to him, you know, and just is so far ahead of the game on so many people. People has written a couple books, has a foundation, and just continues to inspire a lot of people. So one of the better pods I have done, stay tuned for it. And remember to always rate, review, go in and help us out. Give us some love. If you want to find out anything going on in my world, markpattisonnfl.com. And you can find out about my climbs and other podcasts that are there and those things. So with that said, let's get on to a great episode with Jake. And here we go. Hey everybody, it's me, Mark Patterson, back again. This episode is going to be epic. I am here on the campus of USC with a couple buddies. One is my longtime friend, Casey Cosgrove. My daughter also goes here. She's actually not in the building right now, but she's down the street. We're going to pick her up. But more importantly, I'm here with Jake Olson. Jake, how you doing? Good. How are you, Mark? I am doing great. Okay. So let me just give a quick setup as we start to get through this thing. So for the people who don't know who Jake is, you are a, what year in school? Junior? Yeah, I'm a junior. You're a junior here at USC, and you're a football player on the team. Yes. So for a lot of people, because I played football too, so a lot of people would be going, hey, that's cool, but what makes you so unique about this? And I'm about to tell our audience. And that is is that you lost your eyesight many years ago. Yes. And we're going to go through that. So this incredible thing, I want to give this a setup. So I was at home. I was watching your game against Western Michigan. And actually, I didn't know anything about your story. Right. And I tune in the fourth quarter. And then now the announcer starts, you know, building this thing up. And he goes, Hey, and here comes Jake Olson. And he's getting into the game and he's going to long snap for the PAT. And so he started explaining this whole thing. I was just like, Are you kidding me? I watched this whole thing go down. And it was just this incredible thing. And so I, you know, as I'm thinking in my head, I was like, I've got to figure out a way to get this guy on the podcast. Right. I mean, for me, it was such an emotional event. I mean, I can only imagine what that was like for you. Yeah. You know, obviously it was, it was amazing. It was a, a dream come true and, and something that was just fun. I mean, it just was fun going out there and, and something that uh, was, as soon as I left, I was like, man, I want to get back right out there and do it again. So let's go back and talk about how this whole thing kind of came to be. And then we'll kind of like ramp this thing up to where we are today. You guys are going to a bowl game. And, you know, I'll tell you one thing I didn't realize is that when I showed up, I mean, I'm decent size. I'm 6'3", you know, 200 pounds and you're bigger than I am. So, I mean, you look like the part too, right? <laughs> well, so you appreciate that. Yeah, no, you're just not, I mean, seriously, you look like a football player, which is what you want to be, right? Yes. And you guys are now conference champions. Yes. So congratulations Thank on that. You. So let's go back. You know, I did a lot of research on what was going on with your history, and it started off when you were just an infant. You're eight months old. You know, obviously, you can digest the news from doctors, but obviously, you have this type of cancer that affects the eyes. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, the cancer is called retinoblastoma, and at eight months old is when I was diagnosed with it, so when they found it, and it was a bilateral meaning in both eyes, and it I had completely taken over my left eye. And the only, really, the only option there is the removal of the eye because it is a blastoma tumor, meaning it's, it's aggressive and very, you know, it grows very quickly. And so the real fear is the cancer moving through the retina to the optic nerve, then the brain, and then from there, virtually unstoppable. So really the procedure to 
risk that I guess that life threatening situation is the removal of the eye, you know, remove the retina in the eye and, and get the cancer out of there. So that's what happened to my left eye when I was eight months old, or eight months old. Or I guess after everything, I was probably more close to one, but they removed the left eye. And then from the age of one to the age of 12, the cancer had come back, you know, many times or eight times. And, you know, we'd try to fight it. You know, we fought it when I was one years old and it went away. And then a couple of years went by, it came back. We'd fight it again. So that, that process kind of was a merry-go-round state where it just would come back. We'd fight it, go away. So how would you fight that? I mean, with everything. I mean, when I was one, it was some chemo and laser treatment. You know, when I came back, it was chemo, laser treatment. Then there was some cryotherapy that was involved later on. So obviously, we, we hit it, we hit it with radiation a few times as much as we could until, you know, I was, I was pretty much maxed out on radiation. There was some experimental treatments we did with kind of going through my femoral artery, putting a line all the way through my femoral artery, all the way up into my eye and delivering chemo straight to the tumor there. So this is like when you're six years old, seven, this is, eight, yeah, nine, 10, right? 11, 12, right. Yeah. So this is, this is all through that age and uh, those ages. And, and so finally, when it was 12, the cancer came back. And this time, you know, in my mind, I was okay, let's, let's talk about treatment options. Let's talk about, you know, what we can do. But this time, I was really kind of like, okay, well, we, we can try hitting with chemo again. We, we could try cryotherapy, later treatment, but the cancer would become immune to it. I mean, it's, it's not going to react. And the more time you, you know, fiddle around with it, the more chance it has to grow and spread. And so you know, you're throwing dice with your life then at that point. So yeah. again, the, the responsible option is, is the removal of the eye. So what was that like for you? So all these different treatments did, did you know, I'm thinking about Lance Armstrong and some of the people I've read over time and, and, or I've known where, you know, you get injected with this radiation, you know, you're essentially poisoning your body, mm -hmm. right? To get rid of, you know, the cancer cells, right? Mm -hmm. So were you sick or did you lose your hair? Or did you yeah. have to go through all that stuff? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't remember too much when I was one, sorry, when I was five in kindergarten, you know, it kind of started realizing what was happening but yeah i know I, I lost my hair i actually went through four rounds of, like not four rounds necessarily but four different times of chemo when i was one kindergarten first grade and then like fourth grade and in those types of chemos were the you know in, in injecting spending many hours in the hospital just receiving chemo but yeah i mean i lost my hair my hair actually finally i think in fourth grade i didn't lose it and it was like i think my hair was just like all right like we're used to this too now i'm not, <laughs> I'm not going anywhere but no you know I, I was definitely you know sick and uh you know we, i had my cancer treatment at chla so you know we, we'd come up on maybe like a, a tuesday get cancer treatment and the problem really what the problem was i was allergic to a drug called vp16 which was one of the chemo drugs that we were using my body was allergic to it so they had to slowly drip it and mix it with benadryl um so that one actually took like six hours to give so it just you know we were in there all day long um so sometimes we'd stay up here at nighttime at a hotel and then go back the next day and receive the you know the second round of it but I remember, you know, just knowing like that night, like probably around 12 or 1, like I would just wake up and just, you know, start throwing up for a couple hours. Just, you know, it's just an awful feeling because it's not a throw up like, you know, your stomach hurts and it's like, okay, you know, I got that bad food out of my system. It's like, you know, throw up when you have like a stomach virus and it's just like, there's nothing left in your body. You're just heaving. And it's just like, it just won't go away. Yeah. Look, thankfully, I haven't been through this, but it's, I mean, what I imagine is that you go to the shelf and you grab a bottle of Pine Sol, you know, drink it, right? Yeah. And up it comes, right? It's just, you're poisoning your system. It's yeah. awful. It's Mr. Yuck. And so not pleasant, man. Not pleasant at all. So you obviously you were making the responsible decision, as you just mentioned, right? About yes. removal of the other eye. But, you know, kind of the ironic gift in some of this, even though you had to go through the tragedy and the adversity of going through that, is that you got at least 12 years of sight. Right. So tell me how that translates now, because obviously I'm coming from a place where I haven't, I haven't gone through that, but... You know, so you have all these images, what yellow looks like, right? right. You have a yellow lab that's under the yes, table right yes. now, right? So you have a yellow lab and you have a white wall and what blue means and right. what USC. And we'll get into this whole USC thing here shortly. But how does that translate from then to now? And I, I'm really grateful I have those memories. You know, I, I grew up with a yellow lab, not, not, not my guide dog, obviously, but. Um, so, you know, I know what yellow labs look like and, you know, I, I know what obviously things look like. I have a bunch of visual memories and I know when people ask like, what, you know, is it dark or whatever? It's not really dark. Like it's not like, you know, you close your eyes at, at night in your room and like, that's what I see. It's more like, you know, if you, it's almost like a dream you remember, you know, it's like when you're in a dream where it's kind of like, it's, it's, you can picture in your head, you see everything, but like, it's, it's just not as vivid, you know, it's just yeah. kind of, it's, it's, it's memory. 
and so that's what it really is. But yeah, I'm, I'm so grateful that I, I understand what those colors mean. And you know, I, I got to see for 12 years. I mean, that's, that's a blessing. So were you playing sports during this time? Yeah. Is your transitioning from having vision to no vision? Right. I mean, and through the 12 years, obviously with all the treatment, I mean, there was times where I had really low vision. There were sometimes where the vision was better, than, but I mean, it was an up and down thing. So, I mean, no, I love to play sports. You know, I, I played soccer and, and baseball and, and golf and football and, and basketball. And I played, I played all these different sports. And I mean, there's times, you know, in fifth grade, after going through treatment, I really like kind of saw shapes and stuff, but like I played center and just kind of went off the sound of the kind of the dribble and bodies a little bit. Like, so I mean, there's times with that and there's times where, you know, I could see the ball pretty clearly and, you know, easily, sh- you know, shoot from the field and stuff like that. But definitely football and golf were probably the two that I love the most. Basketball was fun. Baseball really wasn't my thing. Uh, to play anyways. So I was reading about this earlier, and I, I needed to know and I have a better understanding of what this was like, that one of your goals, you've got a bunch of them, but someday you want to become the first blind person to be a PGA player. So before we even get there, <laughs> I'm a golfer, right? Not a very good one, but I got to understand how this works because typically, you know, you line up with your where you're going to go and then you look down, you got this thing that doesn't move, but it's hard, hard to hit, it, right? Yes. And then it's very mockingly. It, yeah, it just looks up at you like, bring it on, boy, right? <laughs> so, so I mean, how does this work? Well, you know, it basically, I mean, how it works is from the setup standpoint is my dad is, is my caddy. And, you know, I've, I've golfed with other people, but it does take time to just, I don't dial in and be on the same page, just like any other relationship would. But so my dad's my caddy out there. And, and basically what will happen is he'll grab the club, you know, put it behind the ball, make sure the ball is you know, square on the club face, club face is square to the target. I'll take my stance and... Pretty much then he'll back up and, you know, from there's my swing. I mean, you know, a golf swing, like, you know, many things, uh, as I found out long time, I mean, is, you know, it's, it's a motion and it's a repeatable motion and it's a motion yeah. that requires muscle memory and feel. And if you can dial in on that feel and muscle memory and just repeat it over and over again, you got a productive swing. So it just took a lot and takes a lot of practice. And I was a decent golfer before going blind afterwards. I couldn't make contact with the ball. The also problem was I went blind at 12. So it was like five, six and like by eighth grade, I was like five, 10. <laughs> so, yeah. so like I grew like four or five inches and that can jack up a swing. <laughs> so I was, you know, I couldn't see the ball anymore. My swing is all jacked up. So I just had to kind of restructure everything. But, you know, finally got to a point where it's like, okay, you're making contact with the ball. Okay. Every, sometimes there's a good shot. Okay. There's more good shots, but there's still some really bad shots. Okay. Now there's less bad shots, more good shots. You know, like you just keep progressing until it's like, okay, you know what? You know, you're playing really good golf. You're playing better golf than you could when you, when you saw. What's your handicap? My handicap, you know, I don't get a chance to play much in the fall anymore, which I, but, over the summer, it was probably tracking somewhere around like a 10 or 11. Yeah, so you'd beat me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and there's something wrong with that. <laughs> so, uh, no, but, you know, the one thing that I always find, so everything you're saying is correct and repeatable motion, you're right on. But the thing that's funky about golf, of course, is that rarely you are sitting on the exact same lie. So it's not, right. you know, football field's flat. flat and right. You're right. It's 50 wide by 100 long. So, you know, the ball is above your feet, below your feet, in the grass, right. in the sand, you know, it's always different. The sand, there's really two, I guess, real USGA rules that I break. One's a little more ambiguous than the other. One is grounding club in the hazard. So I can ground yeah. my club in the hazard. And the other one is there's a rule in there that states something about caddies lining up, you know. And so, I mean, I guess my dad, I don't know. It'd be kind of pathetic if someone tried to make that argument. I was like, you can't play because someone lines you up. Like, okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, lies took a little while to get used to. I mean, sometimes they still can get tricky. But yeah, I mean, that's something that is definitely had to be practiced. Chip I mean, that's a lot of feel, understanding what, you know, a 20-yard chip feels like and just repeating that over again, practicing, you know, okay. You know, my dad and I have these conversations like, you know, with Caddy Wood, okay, Jake, you know, we're probably 18 yards from the pin, probably got to carry it at least 12 yards, you know, on the green, but, you know, it's upsloping, so let's land it 18 yards or let's, you know, this, once you get on the green, it's going to probably release to the hole, to downhill, so let's not go more than, you know, 13 or whatever. So yeah. there's conversations like that that just occur, and, and that's, you know, where my field takes in and putting is walking to the hole feeling first off the distance you know by walking understanding okay this is a 19 foot butt i felt it's uphill so let me you know put a 23 you know foot swing on it that you know what that feels like yeah i would say you know you're telling me all this stuff and the thing that just is shooting in my brain right now is what a great dad yes i mean i you know so from which we're going to get into next about this whole usc influence you know to kind of put you on your path and you going to usc games as a kid and growing up but 
you know, to be your caddy, to be your guy, be your, I mean, what a great dad. No, he, he has absolutely been absolutely supportive. I mean, he pushes me very hard. And, you know, the, the thing that's cool with him and I, I appreciate is just he sees a normal golfer out of me and he sees the talent and the skill I possess. And there's some frustrating days on the course where we yell at each other and it's frustrating. And it gets frustrating when he does see me miss hit a ball or not play well, because in his mind, it's like, you know what, Jake, like you have the talent and the skill to absolutely rip up the course out here. And so, you know, on the days that it's not going well, I mean, <laughs> tensions can get high because it's like, you know, we're both frustrated and we both expect better from me. But, you know, it, absolutely. He's just, he pushes me. He wants to go out and have me hit balls. I mean, I think maybe vicariously through, I mean, he's a great golfer himself, but I mean, just, I think it brings him a lot of pleasure just to see his son out there playing well. Yeah. So you grew up in Huntington Beach, right? Yes. And as I like to say a lot, you know, when you find successful people in life, I'm not talking about financially, I'm talking about spiritually, emotionally, you know, physically, you know, certainly it takes a village. And that village has a lot of different people in there, right? And your dad certainly was one of those guys, yeah. right? Another guy in that chain, I think, was Pete Carroll. It was, yes. So how did Pete get involved in your life? Well, when I was 12 going blind and, you know, through that story of, of, of losing my sight, I was told on October 1st, I was losing my sight. And then, you know, November 12th was a surgery. So, you know, there was a month, you know, in, in a few days there that really, I guess I had that it was like, okay, here's your you know, last time of scene. So my story had reached Pete Carroll through various avenues. And so basically he understood I was a huge Trojan fan. I remember saying to my parents something of the fact that, you know, okay, well, I definitely want to go to as many USC games and see many, you know, as many football games as I can. Well, he kind of took that wish and made it to the extreme and invited me up for a, a practice. Obviously, that turned out to be much more than a practice with making me part of the team and sitting through meetings and practices and going to the hotel and eating dinner with all of them after practices and traveling with them to Notre Dame and, you know, on the field before and after games and locker rooms. I mean, just, you know, everything, just basically being an honorary member of the team. Sure. And that was really special, something he did not have to do, but showed enough grace and, and allowed me to do that. And it was just a beautiful experience and something that really took a lot of the pain and put it aside for for the moments I was with that team. I mean, when I was here on campus and, and the meetings and on the field and something just really made me forget about what I was going through. And sure. that's something special. But and what year was that? 2009. So not only was Pete, you know, showing you the love by bringing you around the football program, but from what I could see through some old clips, the players totally yes, embraced you, right? The players totally embraced me. And, you know, it was just, was, it was awesome. You know, I, I, again, I became part of the family. And I mean, that's, as someone, I know you played football and I mean, you're around your brothers. I mean, grow as a family kind of. And, and so, I mean, to be that close with, a bunch of guys that were my superheroes as a 12 year old, you know, I was looking up at this USC team that were just absolutely my superheroes. It was just so special. Yeah. I mean, it's just amazing. So you go through this, right? And obviously there was a distraction because you're around the team, you're around Pete Carroll, they're winning, right? Things are going well. And so now you find yourself in, as you're obviously you're getting older, now you're going into high school yourself, right? So you continue to play some of these different sports. And as a junior, like what got in your mind? Now we're talking about junior in high school. Right. What got in your mind about, I want to travel for the, on the football team? Well, you know, I, I played flag football my seventh, eighth grade year. I actually played after I lost my sight. I played center, you know, just one hand snapping the ball back to the quarterback and you know, it's like football. I kind of like just find a person in front of me, kind of just block them for a little bit. You know, it's just nothing really that intense. It was fun and it's competitive, but fun. And going into high school, I went to Orange Lutheran, which plays in the Trinity League. So modern day, Bos St. John Bosco. Tough Cervo, teams. Very tough teams. Yeah. Very tough teams. Tackle football. So it became much more serious much more physical. Uh, and I said, you know what, I'm like, I'm, I'm not going to play center on tackle. I mean, you know, I can't call out who the Mike linebacker is or, you know, stuff yeah. like that. So I didn't play, but sitting there on Friday nights, my freshman and sophomore year, just like, okay, this just doesn't feel right. You know, I had friends on the team and seeing them kind of just have that again, camaraderie and brotherhood with other players on the team, you know, the hallways and, you know, the lockers and at lunchtime. It's just like, you know, I, I'm missing this and I don't want to look back in college and be like, you know, I, I should have played high school ball. And so I started thinking, okay, well, what's a position I could play? And you know, I snapped back to the quarterback. Back, so I was like, okay, well, what about the long snap? Now, long snap is much different than just snapping one hand back to the quarterback, but yep. it was at least a position that's okay. You know, this is back kind of the golf aspect. This is a position where it's eight yards for a field goal, 15 yards for a punt. So it's muscle memory, just getting that feel down of, of what a good snap feels like and just repeating it over and over and over again. Yep. So imagine there must have been somebody already on the team 
that was snapping these things, right? So yes, so there was a guy who actually went to Utah. He was two years ahead of me. So he went to Utah the year I was started practicing. And basically what was also brought to my attention was this guy named Chase Dominguez. And Chase was leaving. He was one of the best long snappers in the country. And the coaches had just completely ignore the fact that he was going to be gone one day. So, I mean, there's this big vacancy of like, okay, well, who's going to be our next snapper? Because Chase was it. And there's really, again, not anyone that we've prepared to take his place. So I came in and then pretty much just practiced hard with the coach. Coach Vies was kind of the special teams guy. who I kind of understood snapping more than any other coach. So that summer going into junior year, I mean, we worked every day, really kind of taught me the skills because I was not good at first. Yeah, but he's another guy in your village. Yes. Right? He is. Yes. Coach Vies is definitely a guy in the village that, again, started helping me practice. He'll admit at first, he's like, this kid is just, I guess we'll just kind of entertain him. Like, I don't think he's become a snapper because, again, it just was pretty bad at first. But throughout this summer, I mean, his confidence started going like, okay, wow, actually, this kid can actually snap. You know, let's, let's keep practicing, keep practicing, keep practicing. And sure enough, in fall camp, then when we all got back as a team, it was like, okay, well, you know, Jake is the best long snapper we have on the team. Let's, you know, let's put him on varsity and start varsity junior, senior year. And, and I did not do the punt snaps, although, you know, <laughs> it, it would have been interesting, obviously, because there's just some blocking right. responsibilities downfield. We could have maybe found a way. I don't know, but I, at least I got PAT and field goal. So that's great. That's great. You know, there's another guy that this whole same story, not your exact story, but trying to find a way on the football field. Although in this guy's case, he didn't have any experience. And that's the guy that you know, Nate Boyer. Yes. Right. So yes. Nate is a green, green beret. beret. Yep. That I climbed on a project this last February with six other other NFL guys and four green berets, and two of them were amputees. Was that uh, Kilimanjaro? Kilimanjaro. Yeah. So I've I've climbed it twice, and it was just great to hear you know Nate and his story and how he yes, you know he's he was a great. At, he's a great guy. So he's down at Texas, and I, and I actually I talked to him last week, and not knowing there was any connection between yeah. you two, and I, actually I was saying because we're going to do a podcast together, okay. and I was saying hey I'm going down to do a pod with Jake and then after Jake maybe I can roll up to your place up in Hollywood and blah 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 he goes wait a minute I know Jake I was yeah. down there trying to help them we've snapped a few times together yeah and he said the NCA came in and blocked it or something right yeah they're just yeah they're I mean because I don't know it's some rules with training and and I don't know it, stupid it, yeah all right uh, yeah so anyways but the, just that whole similar story of how he found his way onto the University of Texas team when he was like 31 right he's yes. out there with all these young bucks yes right and like you and, and right. uh, but it worked and he found his way and he yeah. got to travel with the Seahawks yes you know with your old coach coach Carroll yeah coach Carroll that's right so okay so you find your way on the field you make it happen it's junior year senior year you're part of with your buddies camaraderie it's all good mm-hmm. right and now you come to graduate and you decide at that point to go to USC or did you go someplace else first? No, no. I knew I wanted to go to USC. Like my Facebook status, like of where I went to the school is like USC since like eighth grade. So <laughs> <laughs> it's just, I just, I always wanted to go to USC. So I applied there and really it was like February came around and waiting obviously to hear back from schools. And I got a call from the athletic department to say, Hey, you know, like, you know, you're coming here. We'd love to offer you a walk on spot on to play as, as a long snapper on the team. And that obviously was just. And who said this? Sark? Yeah. So Sark, Pat Hayden kind of had, you know, agreed that, okay, you know, again, if Jake's coming here and obviously, you know, he's long snapped the last two years on varsity, why, like, why not? Give him a walk on spot as a long snapper on the team. Right. So, I mean, that, and that was just absolutely amazing. <laughs> during from true. So, who gave you that call? Actually, the, the guy who gave me the call was named uh, Ron Orr, and he kind of was, he works in the athletic department here. He he actually heads up uh, Swim with Mike, which is one of the scholarship organizations that gives me my scholarship. Um, so, he called me up and said, you know, you're going to Swim with Mike scholarship. We want you to come to, there's a, a banquet every year right after signing day a few days after signing day that you know pretty much coach helton well i guess coach Stark at the time the head coach of the football team goes and you know brings all the big donors in and the big boosters and says you know pretty much shows a bunch of tape like highlights all the new guys coming in you know big like you know like we got all these guys right so he invited me to that dinner and, and at the end of the dinner you know said okay and, you know we also got you know jake olson coming on the team and so that, that was kind of the, the big announcement that so that was that was real fun uh, I, I can't even imagine to go from high school to your dream school. And now you're actually playing for USC. Yes. That's amazing. You know, my daughter who goes here, as I was telling you, you know, she went to the uh, U of A. Mm-hmm. And after two years, she was kind of scared to call me and say, hey, dad, uh, I've just, you know, I want to transfer to USC. What do you think? And I'm like, that's a slam dunk, man. You got to do it. I'm a Husky too. Yeah. Right. But, you know, it's just, you know, there's great things that go on here at the university. And from a football standpoint, certainly the, the uh, tradition, we're sitting here in Heritage Hall. And a buddy Casey over here next to me showed me all the Heisman trophies <laughs> when we walked in here. So there's a lot of history, of course. Okay. 
So you have now been on the team for three years? Yes, this was, this was my third year, yeah. Tell me what practice is like for you then. Practice is, you know, for law specialists, is, you know, obviously there's certain periods throughout the practice that we're with the team live, you know, for me, you know, doing field goal, you know, again, for, you know, punts. I'm, I don't, I'm not out there doing punts, but there's different special team periods. So, but for the other time, it's just, you know, personal work of, you know, just getting snaps in with, with the, you know, the holder and, you know, working on just, you know, drills that you can do to, just help with spiral and, and, you know, accuracy, whatever it is. So, you know, a lot of it for any specialist, a lot of times, you know, for a couple of periods, you, you are just kind of hanging out, um, yeah. not working all the time, but you know, you just got to make sure you get your work in. You just got to make sure you get your work in and, you know, understanding it's, I guess now it's like, I guess we played 13 games now, you know, so it's a 14 game season, you know, it's broken over what, like four or five months. Yeah, sure. So, you know, you're not wanting to be out there every day snapping for 25 minutes, you know, cause it's just like after a while you're, you're going to get worn out. Yeah. So you just gotta make sure you, you get your job. If there's something you work on, you work on it and you just want to just, I guess, kind of manage, manage and, and upkeep. So while we're on that, we're sitting here, as I said, in Heritage Hall, and we're in this room, and we're having this podcast, and the, the equipment is set up on the table. Under the table, there's this guy named Quebec. He's yes. this guide dog, right? So yes. I can't imagine he's out there, like, you know, <laughs> he on lugs or something. What, what's he doing out there? Quebec stays in the locker room. Yeah. But he's everyone's favorite, you know, person on the team, I'd say. Yeah. <laughs> he runs around. Just everyone loves him. He's a great dog. I mean, he's been my guide dog for about six and a half years. I mean, he just, you know, helps me tremendously and my best friends and he's been to practice a few times there's actually a funny story when i was a freshman i was when i first got here they were still kind of clearing something with me obviously medically and it's really late and all that stuff and so i was out there for a friday walkthrough before kind of our just like it wasn't for an actual game it was just like pretty much just like a mock game and basically i had quebec with me because you know i wasn't dressed or anything like that yep. and i was kind of just hanging out in quebec like also just took off and like it kind of surprised me so his leash ripped out of my hand what happened was sark kind of threw who sark would always play a scout offense as a quarterback and sark who's the head coach at the time. time right and so he threw a ball to a guy named jonathan lockett and jonathan was receiver and, and he kind of threw a screen kind of towards our way well jonathan caught it in quebec i guess wanted to get into play so he took off after jonathan so jonathan like sees his dog coming and he like looks at sark like what do i do what do i do and sark just like run <laughs> so like so there's this Chase film of like him. yeah so they're they're probably on like i don't know like the you know 35 going in or something so like there's just like this film of like jonathan lockett running fast as he could quebec like kind of trying to gain on him and then like three or four people like trying to chase after quebec like it's it's really hysterical and oh, everyone everyone gosh. just busted up that is great so now it's three years later right and you get to this game on September 2nd against Western Michigan and just the way things all played out. You guys were ahead. Probably wouldn't have mattered if you were behind, but your head coach, Clay Hilton, wanted to insert you into the games. Mm -hmm. Was that planned or was, how yeah. did that all, you know, play? Yeah, he came in and told me, you know, beforehand that, you know, Jake, we we're, we're going to get you into this game. And so just, you know, mentally prepare and, and get yourself ready. And so, yeah, I mean, I knew I was going in and didn't know really when, but, and, you know, it was alpha pick six. So that was, that was fun just because, you know, it's like, all right, <laughs> quick situation, let's go. But no, it was awesome finally getting out there. Again, it was, it was an addicting feeling. I loved going out there. You know, I've, obviously I understood the significance of the moment. It was emotional, but the same time you know I, f I felt ready i felt prepared it was something i've done many many times so it just was going out there and just doing something i knew how to do and so it was fun it was absolutely just a blast you know i got to do it again against oregon state and these last two games man i was i was right almost ready to get in yeah. uh, and unfortunately just time ran out but you know definitely be looking for for more experiences out on the field. It's, it's always exciting. And I just, I just love doing it. Yeah. Well, you look confident too. I mean, that was the big thing that when you ran out there, the guy, I don't know if he was the kicker. A holder, holder. Yeah. Why is the one who runs the me out, lines me up? Yeah. yeah. So you were kind of holding on, you were mm -hmm. behind him, you're holding on yep. to his left or right shoulder. And he basically guided you out there and then kind of set you in place. But, you know, when, when you went out there, just, you know, with your size, I mean, you look like you belong. You <laughs> I know, appreciate you, that. No, seriously. I mean, you didn't look like you were out of place at all. Yeah. Well, I mean, that was the thing that, you know, my freshman year, especially, I, I came in about like 185. And so, you know, first, I guess, because I can't see, you know, they just were kind of like comments on, you know, okay, well, you know, it's getting bigger or whatever. So I worked really hard and kind of put on, you know, 40 pounds over the last forty forty five pounds over the last, you know, two years and really try to just pass the eye test and not give any any sense of doubt like yeah, that kid doesn't belong out there. Well, listen, I was the same way. I, I mean, I was fairly highly recruited at a high school and, you know, I came in 181 pounds. I could not bench my weight. <laughs> 
Right. And, you know, when I finally started playing, you know, I was, you know, like 198 and right. I could bench a lot of weight. And so, I mean, you just got to physically be you ready do. to take yeah. the, you know, if you're going to play in the Pac-12, you got to be ready for it. Yes. Right. It's the way it goes. So that's awesome. So, okay. So now you guys are on to, you're playing Penn State? Ohio, Ohio State. Ohio State, State yeah. Right? Ohio State at the uh, Cotton Bowl. Yep. And what date is that going to be on? December 29th. December 29th. So, you know, it was interesting because, so you suit up for all the home games, Mm -hmm. right? And then for the bowl game, you'll be there, I'm sure. Yeah. And I've traveled a couple of times this season as well. You have. Mm -hmm. So it was interesting because I happened to see USC after you'd played that first game. And it might've been maybe the second game or third. I can't remember, but I think the team had gone to play somewhere and you went to New York. Yeah. That was against Cal. Yes. Cow, yeah. Yes. So who, yeah, and I, it was like ABC or CBS or NBC, one of the, right? Yeah, ABC, yeah, that I flew out there because they wanted me on the uh, Good Morning America. Yeah, I'm like, man, if this guy can do that, he can do my show. <laughs> 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 so what was that like? You're Good Morning America? I mean, my goodness. Uh, right? It was fun. It was fun. It's a hectic show, man. There's Everyone's running around backstage. Like, it's pretty hectic, but it was fun. We caught a red eye out there. And so. And who's we? My sister, my twin sister, who goes to SC as well. She's here, another member of the village. And then my manager and uh, best friend, uh, Daniel, who you talked to to set this up. Yeah. So we went out there and just made a quick trip, flew back on Sunday, but it was fun. It was a good time. We also did the uh, Harry Connick show out there and, and taped that after Good Morning. Meaning you, you were on the show? Yes. Yeah. Did he sing to you? Did he swoon? Did uh, he, <laughs> he did not. I actually, I actually taught him how to snap his best. <laughs> like, oh, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. Entertainers try to pull that off. So, okay. So look, you've accomplished a lot, right? And we're still going to get into some more things here. So we're not done with this. But one of the things that's on my bucket list is to write a book, Mm -hmm. right? About, you know, from the NFL to starting businesses to climbing these crazy mountains, right? And seeing it all. And and now I'm so blessed to be doing these podcasts, right? Because I'm talking to these studs like you and and women who just have done these amazing things and Mm -hmm. overcome, you know, crazy adversity. But one of the things I'm trying to do is write a book. And I go do a little research. You've written two, right? So I'm trying to figure out you're a full-time student playing football you know like i got to get my act together so you've written this book called open your eyes yes tell me if this is right 10 uncommon lessons to discover a happier life yes everybody could use that yeah no i mean it was it was a a really cool book so i you know i I go out and speak a lot and it was in eighth grade so about you know a year or so after i had lost my sight and i was speaking at a company called mel luca out in utah and their president of the company kind of did was there and he you know i obviously met him you know he's the president of the company but he sent us a letter after i got home and really said okay well i saw your story i really love it and i didn't know this but he's also a he has a phd in psychology He's, he's a professor at byu and basically said, you know, I've been wanting to write a book and I have a lot of these ideals and just what you talked about, you have a lot of these same ideals. And so there was this kind of connection between us of, okay, well, let's let's share these ideas then and write a book together. So the book is how it's laid out is, you know, he writes a lot of you know, the, the uncommon lessons, you know, and what they are. And I put my excerpts in there of, okay, this is how I've used them in my life. This is my views on them. You know, this is what, you know, uh, again, how. So give me one. Well, one that I really talk about a lot in life is what we call it the setup and the setback, meaning that in every setback, there's a setup waiting to happen and how to stay patient and persevere through those setbacks. Not always kind of keep your eyes not on the setback and not focus just on the setback, but rather divert your vision to the setup that's going to come and understanding that in every setback, there's a setup. So in my life, my setbacks were going through cancer and going blind, but it has set me up this life of amazing opportunities. You know, I am who I am today because I went through that. You know, I, I get to play football at USC. I've gotten to go around and inspire thousands of people, meet tons of cool people. And all that's just because of my setbacks. I mean, it set me up for a, a life that, again, of just amazing opportunities and potential. Yeah. No, I first of all, I love that, right? And the thing that I have found, and I say to people, is that where your focus goes, your energy always follows, right? So it's the same thing as what you're talking about. And too many people focus on the negative stuff that hits them, right? Versus the path out. And if you just be patient and let it go, it will actually set you up for great things to come. Right. Yes. That's what we talk about. You know, it's, it's, you know, it turned molehills into mountains, you know, you take these little things and, and turn them into these big things. And you, you know, you all of a sudden something bad happens and you just, oh man, this is going to ruin my entire life. And you let it take over this and that. And all of a sudden, you know, it has taken over your whole life because you thought it would. And it's a self-fulfilling prophecy and you focused on it too much. And instead of rather just saying, okay, you know, here's something that has happened. Let me find a way through this. Let me not treat it like it's a huge mountain that's going to you know, stop all my progress in life, but rather find a way around it. Well, that's part of the reason why this name of this podcast is called Finding Your Summit, right? <laughs> and it's really metaphorical, 
right? So, I mean, you're just talking about it in the way of, you know, overcoming your mountain. And I know you weren't trying to tie it in necessarily, but, you know, I think everybody has their different summit, their right. different mountain, their different obstacle. I mean, for somebody, it might be, I'm trying to get my, my summit to just to get my PhD or something at USC. And somebody else might be going through a hard time. And somebody else, you know, for me, it's climbing these crazy mountains, right? right? So, but I've had different summits along the path, yeah. right? And that's just life because different things hit you at different and, times. And I'm sure along the lines of, of climbing those mountains, you've had a few setbacks in that. There's been a lot of setbacks. It's too. like, you know, you can let it stop your climb. You can let it stop, you know, that your goal of reaching the summit, or you can find a way and push through that. Well, listen, my biggest setback of all time was losing the USC my senior year, right? <laughs> <laughs> we were number one in the country. But I've had to get over that. Crazy. So, okay. So, a lot of this, too, is let's talk about the book leading to the foundation that you've set up. Yeah, the, the foundation I set up is called Out of Sight Faith. And that really came about because. I, one of the many things I had to relearn how to do after going blind was obviously read and write, you know, learning Braille and staying in the same class and, you know, relearning how to learn almost, you know. So unfortunately, the sad truth is, you know, a lot of visually impaired and blind kids are, you know, kind of put in these special classes that, you know, aren't with regular kids. And, and, you know, because it's like, okay, well, they could have amazing minds and have every ability to learn, but they need to be taught in a more kind of creative different way sometimes of just not writing a shape on the board and, you know, just saying that this angle goes with this thing. You know, it's like, so there has to be a little bit of a different structure there. One of the things that really helps bridge that gap is technology. And I learned that very quickly that really grateful to live in the 21st century where, you know, Apple's done a great job with voiceover. It's the software they have on there on all their products that really helps use everything from their, you know, an iMac and iBook to even an iPhone. And even there's some other technology out there specifically meant for blind people, but it ha- helped me stay in the regular classroom, take notes, you know, write essays that, you know, I could just put them on a flash drive and the teacher could read. You know, stuff like that that just allows you to do it. Just, just absolutely allows you to, to be in a normal classroom and, and learn. And problem is a lot of this stuff is expensive, you know, especially the blind related technology, you know, there's not a, obviously a big market for it. So a lot of it can get really expensive. So. I realized the need for it and, you know, the price of it. So I created a foundation that raised money, therefore, to help kids who couldn't afford the technology to get the technology they needed to succeed in school. Because again, I, you know, I don't think a kid who has, again, every bit of potential to learn, ability to learn should be held back just because, you know, they can't find the right tool in the toolbox to work in the classroom. Yeah. Hey, listen, this whole thing, this whole story is just really incredible and amazing. And you talked about the set back and set up. And I really feel like, you know, you're put on this earth for this particular reason. You've done so many things, you know, from having overcome this adversity to show people what is possible, right? Just yeah. because you have some physical disabilities doesn't mean that you can't do and lead a very productive life. And not just that, you're crushing it, man. You're, you're out <laughs> you there, raised think. over a hundred grand you're writing books, you know, you've set up foundations, you're playing on the football team, you're going to play Ohio State, right? Yeah. You're long snapping, you're on Good Morning America. I mean, I'm in my 50s. I think I have to catch up to you, man. <laughs> I've got a long way to go. But anyways, listen, it's been an absolute treat. We've been trying to put this thing together yes, for a couple months I'm now. Glad we finally got to do it. Now it's all good, man. I understand that the path, I, I was there at one point in time in my life, and so I get it. You're a busy guy. But you know, at the end of the day, we got this done, and I can't wait to share this to the audience out there. They're going to oh, yeah. love this story. And for everybody else out there listening, I mean, pay attention to this guy, Jake Olson. <laughs> uh, what number are you on the field? 61. 61. 61 is the guy to follow. He'll be back again next year for your senior year, right? Yes. And that's just, you know, it's a great story. So we will put in the show notes where they can find you, your foundation. You know, if there's an opportunity for people to donate to that, they can. And beyond that, thank you. I'm very grateful and I appreciate it. I'm perfect. Fight on. All right. Bye-bye. Hey, and thank you so much for listening to the Find Your Summit podcast. We are so glad to have you along for this journey. And if you enjoy the show, please tell a friend, share it on iTunes, spread it to the planet. We're looking to broadcast this to every person that is out there because, as you know, everybody has their own summit that they're going after. If you're looking to follow my journey, you can find that through my social links on markpattisonnfl.com. That's Mark, M-A-R-K, Pattison, P-A-T-T-I-S-O-N, NFL.com. So until the next podcast, just remember, clear eyes, full hearts, and remember, it takes a little more to make a champion, so make it happen. Thank you. Bye.